Good morning. Uh, Churchill, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you. Welcome to this week's uh, edition of the weekly investor briefing. And uh, today we have our head of research, who is Churchill Ogutu, and uh, Matthew Kabere from FX Pesa. So, uh, in light of uh, last week's goodbyes from one of our own, Gerald. So uh, this week we'll have uh, Chachi Logutu taking the equities and uh, the fixed income and macro macroeconomics. Over to you, Churchill. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Happy belated Valentine's or men's conference, whichever side of the aisle you are sitting. So let me just uh, kick off with uh, sharing my screen. Dan. You're good to go. Thanks. Okay, so I'll take you through the the weekly investor briefing. <clears throat> so I'll start with the the what happened in the macro, a um, good income, and a bit of a headline numbers on the like. Uh, so last week we saw the supplementary budget one for the current financial year being tabled in parliament. Uh, that was on Tuesday's sitting. And based on the supplementary budget, we are seeing that there's an overall increase of 75.14 billion, uh, of which to the executive, uh, we are seeing uh, close to 79 billion uh, increase. Uh, with the judiciary and legislative, we are seeing a reduction of uh, 200 and, uh, like 250 million. 250 million and 3.3 billion respectively. So the overall increase is 75.14 billion. So what will happen is, is that uh, the budget and appropriation committee will now sit on these numbers and it will give its uh, recommendation, which will now form the basis of the supplementary appropriation bill, which will be out sometime, say at the very earliest sometime next week. Uh, moving on to the other aspect of uh, the supplementary budget, there were some revisions that were made on the consolidated fund services. So for the consolidated fund services, this is primarily a fast charge in the budget. Uh, it comprises of public debts, uh, where we're seeing the interest and redemptions. Uh, there's also a significant aspect of the others is now on pensions. So the changes we've seen on the consolidated fund services, we are seeing that interest payment in the current financial year has been reduced by 4 billion. And then the redemptions, both internal and external has increased by 58 billion. Looked at it the other way, we are seeing that external debt service costs, uh, that's both interest and redemptions has gone up by 77.9 billion. And uh, just to stop at this point, we remember that there was uh, the debt service suspension initiative uh, that was announced at early last month, whereby for the Paris Club bilateral creditors, there was uh, something in the order of 32.6 billion. And then for the non Paris Club bilateral creditors, where China is a major player there, we, we saw that there was an, an additional 40.9 billion. But looking at that DSSI, total was coming to around 73.5 billion. But here we are seeing that the, in, uh, the, the, the external debt service costs has been reduced by 77.9 billion. So it suggests that, that uh, the DSSI has been factored in with this, the con within the context of the supplementary budget. But nonetheless, we are seeing that on the other hand, on the internal debt service costs, uh, we are seeing that there's an increase of uh, 132 billion shillings. So that obviously offsets the benefits from the DSSI. And it's, 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 it's quite uh, key to note what uh, what will be the reaction amidst that right now uh, these uh, the talks for the new IMF program and what it fits in in the whole grand scheme of things. So that's something worthwhile to watch out. 
In pensions, uh, there's a reduction of 8.1 billion uh, to 111.1 billion. Uh, so that is in regards to the supplementary budget one that you've seen. Moving on towards the end of the week, the final 2021 budget policy statement was published. Uh, it's there in the National Treasury website. And uh, we are seeing that the overall uh, revenue and financing uh, is coming to 3.5 trillion shillings. Uh, 3.5 trillion shillings where we are seeing uh, that uh, total revenue is 2 trillion. Ordinary revenue, the next financial year, this number says for the next financial year, we are seeing an increase from 1.57 trillion in the current revised financial year to 1.78 trillion. So that's a near 200 billion increase in ordinary revenue, which comprises tax revenue and the non-tax revenue. For the appropriation in aid, we are seeing uh, 258 billion. Grants is around 46.1 billion. And then we, we have done the gross financing. We know that uh, what the BPS has factored in is what is called the net financing, which is a reduction from uh, 966 in the current financial year to 930 billion in the next financial year. But that said, we are seeing that there's that aspect of redemptions, uh, both internal and external, which is coming to another 486 billion. So the gross financing uh, in the next financial year is 1.4 trillion. So giving us a total of uh, 3.5 trillion. So we know that revenue and financing is one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is now the expenditure, the expenditure, which is also similar, which is equally at 3.5 uh, trillion. I would have let this point sink in for a couple of minutes. We just remain silent for two minutes, but no, Dan will be on my neck that we are wasting time. So we'll just move on. But just ponder the thought that the next financial year's budget is $3 trillion, of which uh, national government is at uh, close to $2 trillion. Uh, the biggest chunk of that is on the executive at $1.9 trillion. Judiciary is at uh, Eighteen billion, and then legislative is at another thirty-eight billion. So cumulatively is at one point nine uh, seven trillion. And now consolidated fund service uh, from uh, one trillion, uh, one trillion in the current financial year to one point one six trillion in the next financial year. And then finally, uh, county equitable share revenue. Remember last week, a I think it was in this webinar when we talked about uh, county equitable share revenue uh, being at uh, 343 billion. At that, we've seen that there was an IBEC meeting uh, that was held midweek, which now ramped up the county equitable share revenue to 370 billion. So the rationale behind that is that uh, they are looking at the base of the county equitable revenue share which is for the current financial year, which is 316.5 billion. And then they increased, uh, there's a growth in, in, in regards to revenue, an additional 36.1 billion. And then there's another 17 billion thereabouts, uh, which was on account of, uh, uh, of uh, uncondition, unconditional grants to the national government, which were converted to be unconditional grants. So aggregating all that is coming to 370 billion, which is giving us our budget at 3.5 trillion. So the point that we are, the whole point about looking at the supplementary budget in the current financial year, and also the budget, potential budget in the next financial year is because of uh, the role that the national government plays uh, or rather the government spending uh, plays in the whole aggregate in the GDP. Uh, the numbers is in the order of 13%. Uh, that's the, the aspect that the government plays uh, directly in terms of supporting growth. So yes, we are seeing a 3.5 uh, trillion shillings, but now in as much as the government 
is seeing an increased spending. Now the other question that policymakers or people who are observing the budget will be asking themselves is the quality of the spending. Is it being directed to the productive places? Is, it, is there some quality or there is some value add from even the public investment that is coming, uh, coming from this uh, expenditure? So the jury is out there, but this is as it is uh, the government spending for the next financial year. Uh, moving on now to the fixed income segment, uh, rather before you go that, uh, what uh, documents, the other documents that are still pending that should be either out today or tomorrow uh, is the now the 2021 medium term debt management uh, strategy paper. Uh, it's supposed to be tabled in the National Assembly. So National Assembly is, is having a sitting tomorrow. So that's where we are putting it at 16th of February, now tomorrow. Or it will just be published in the National Treasury website and then people can be able to have a look at what it's all about. And then the other document is now the quarterly economic and budgetary review, uh, which is as at the end of December. And basically that's the half year numbers in the current financial year. So that's another thing that we are watching out for in the course of this week. So getting on to the fixing segment, we are seeing that uh, in regards to the secondary market activity, uh, it was stable. Uh, it remained at 21.3 billion. And most of the trades were on the 16-year infrastructure bond, the one that was issued in January, uh, that's uh, in formal terms is IFB 1-2021-16. Uh, in regards to T-bills, uh, the performance rate was slightly better than the previous week uh, at 90%, uh, but in aggregate terms, that was 21.7 billion. But nonetheless, it still, it fell short of the 24 billion that the Apex Bank, Central Bank was seeking. Uh, yields uh, went up across the tenors, that's the 91 day, 182 day and 364 day. And on a year to date, Comparison, we've seen that yields across the board have been have increased by 0.24%. And moving on to the liquidity trends, last week the average interbank declined um, by 0.91% to an average of 4.41%. On the other end, uh, we saw the open in the open market operations, we saw that uh, CBK majorly stayed out of intervening. So it's just telling us that liquidity was stable throughout the last week, except for one day when it came in seeking uh, to mop up 5 billion. It received bids of uh, 12.6 billion and it accepted 5 billion. But nonetheless, it was majorly uh, out of the open market operations. Net domestic borrowing in our estimates, uh, we are seeing it's around 312 billion. And comparing with the revised target in the current financial year, which is at 540 billion, we are seeing that 57.1% uh, of the target has already been met as at this, as at the end of last week. Moving on to the week's trade, we are still uh, we are still uh, constructive on the trade that we pitched last week. And that's the sell on the current uh, infrastructure bond paper. We are seeing that it's rallied. Uh, from the point where, from the time it was uh, brought on board, there's been some rally. So investors who are holding this paper can exit or they can reduce their holding. Uh, there's some opportunities there. In the same breath, we know that uh, CBK uh, put up the top sale uh, for the February paper, the two papers that were issued in February. Uh, that's the FXD1 20. 13, 15, and then the FXD1, 2012, 20. And I remember in the last week's session, we had some uh, thoughts around this. What will be the next move? Either going the top sale route or getting into CBK, reissuing some new papers. Those papers are fresh or bringing on board some new papers. But what CBK opted is because they accepted 32 billion in the previous sale, so, and they were seeking 50 billion. So the top sale is uh, of a value amount of 18 billion. So once that uh, order has been filled, uh, that's when they can be able to close it. But nonetheless, we are not quite uh, bullish that it will be able to meet the 18 billion that it's seeking. There's not been some much appeal or there's not been 
that robust demand in these two papers. So we are not quite uh, optimistic that that 18 billion order will be will be filled in the in the by the market. So I'll just touch a bit about the the headline numbers when it comes to equities. That's the recap for last week. Uh, the indices, uh, Nairobi All Share Index and the NSE 20 both uh, jumped up last week, 4.4% uh, and 1.3% respectively. Uh, Canova declined uh, by 35% to 2 billion. Uh, there are some uh, figures, sorry, about that which are not clear, but uh, it's, it's my fault. Apologies about that. Uh, moving on to the fix. Uh, the foreign participant segment, we saw that uh, activity participation was around 68.4%, and the net total net inflows was 78 million. Uh, we saw accumulation on Safaricom uh, equity, EABL. Uh, definitely for Safaricom, uh, there's a bit of some uh, optimism amongst the investors after that interim dividend was announced last week. So we saw also foreigners taking advantage of that. Uh, exits uh, on uh, KCB Group, uh, top traded counters, uh, usual culprits, quote unquote, Safaricom, KCB, Equity, EABL, and Standard Holdings. And in regards to where our market sits against the African peers, uh, we're seeing that uh, in terms of uh, PE, uh, market uh, price to earnings, this is a metric which tells us whether it's overvalued in a way, on a relative basis, whether it's uh, overvalued against either historic trends or even against the peers. So in regards to PE uh, metric, Kenya is slightly overvalued against the African average, we are seeing that it's 11.9 times, uh, whereby the African average, the ones that you are tracking, uh, is sitting at 9.7 times. So on that metric alone, Kenya seems to be a bit overvalued. Uh, dividend yield, it's slightly lower than the African peers that we are tracking at 4.1% against the African average of 5.2%. Uh, lastly, uh, the corporate calendar, uh, Kenjen, uh, is a final dividend of 30 cents. A book, book closure is on the 29th of April. Uh, Car and General it issued a final dividend of 80 cents. Uh, book closure is on the 22nd of February, uh, which will be in two weeks' time. Uh, Safari last next sorry next week. Uh, Safaricom uh, lastly uh, issued an uh, interim dividend of foot five cents. Uh, book closure on the fifth of March, and we are still on the lookout of the full year earning season in the next uh, two months. Predominantly banking sector, and the yeah from the banking sector from predominantly. I'll stop this slide at this. I'll be joined by one of my colleagues at some point in this webinar, but I'll hand it over to Matthew, who will walk us through the global markets. Okay, very good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, briefing today. I will be sharing my screen. Right, hope you can see my screen. Churchill, please confirm. Yes, yes. All right, thank you. So we just let's delve into the global markets. And again, welcome to this presentation. And um, on the global market side, looking at last week, uh, the CPI readings fell short of the expectations. Of course, um, that one is an indication that uh, there is controlled inflation, at least it won't be going that high so fast. And um, the likelihood of Fed increasing uh, or releasing out the stimulus again remains a long way. That's one uh, event that might have caused a hike in the inflation levels. So when prices continue to rise amid uh, falling rates of of COVID-19 infections. Remember, it still remains to be a challenge, though we have um, 
the vaccine which is helping out there. And uh, as a result of that, of course, gold has fallen, uh, of course, because of uh, the recovery which is upcoming. And that one is also evident from the rising 10 year bond yields. And of course, um, a stronger dollar. So the week ahead, of course, we're looking up to US inflation numbers to be released. So remember uh, that this week um, is the US President's Day today, right? So might not be quite big impact, but this week again, there are disruptions by the Chinese New Year. And of course, this is US President's Day. And um, the, the week ahead sees a very busy schedule for data releases and important of course, the Friday's release of the February uh, manufacturing and services flash PMIs for the Eurozone, the US, Japan, and the UK. Those ones will really uh, give a, a little bit of an excitement in the market. Then, of course, we're looking up to the industry production, trade balance, Eurozone, inflation readings in Canada, employment in Australia, and also looking up to the FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee meetings, uh, out there in, in Australia and again, European uh, Commission as they assess their monetary, monetary policy trends. Now the key events lined up for this week, of course, uh, you, you can't check on the economic calendar, you will see all this, but just to note, we have a Eurogroup meeting today, right, and the industrial production on Tuesday, you need to look up to the, 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 the RBA monetary policy, for the Australian dollar moves. And then on Wednesday, of course, we have the FOMC, very important. And again, in UK, we have to keep keep watch on that because it's very important. We really don't have uh, big, big news for the UK this week, but um, just need to watch out for, 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 the, for the movements in terms of how the coronavirus is affecting them and the, and the distribution of the vaccines. Thursday, again, US unemployment claims will give us some direction. And on Friday there, you can see the, the, the services PMI, flash manufacturing services PMI. Now products to watch, Euro USD, Euro dollar. Um, currently it's just hovering around um, the 1.2, 1.21 level, trying to test that level. And again, we can see that it's, it's trading above the moving averages a rebound along that uh, 1.209, right? It's got a very nice support there. And um, I'm still waiting to test that 1.215 level. If it breaks beyond that level, then uh, we're gonna again wait and see whether, because it, it, it will be up to test the 1.22 levels. And then uh, that, that's what we're looking up to. So in that event, again, if it's trading above the moving averages, uh, we need to, check out for, for, for opportunities on the upside, but currently just testing that level, we have to keep our fingers crossed to see and to wait and see whether it's going to break uh, beyond that resistance level. So again, what remains of focus for Euro USD or Euro dollar, just uh, check on the PMI, the PMIs. Again, pound USD, we can see there, uh, again, trading above the moving averages, getting a very nice support there at 1.37, which has been holding as a previous resistance level. And at that point, again, uh, as, as at the time when I was, when I was checking on this, when I was taking this, um, this data, it, it has not yet tested the 1.39 1 level, but currently it is already breaking through the 1.39 level. And um, we're looking forward to see whether it's going to maintain that and it might be checking out to retest the the highs of 27 2018 i mean because that's 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 where it might be going through so last week pair continued its rise especially after the gdp reading and um again just like for the us uh for, for the pound for the euro usd going to be monitoring the pmi readings for this week so for the for the guys who are interested with stocks and who are trading stocks again Something very nice here for you, top companies to watch this week, based on what we're expecting on uh, the announcement of their earnings. Tuesday, tomorrow, Glencore, CVS. On Wednesday, BAT, Shopify, and Hyatt. 
They are on Thursday, you can see. We have them Walmart, Dropbox, Marriott. On Friday, talking of Alliance. And um, if you are taking advantage of the stock market outside there, it's always good to, good to watch out for those announcements because again, they really cause uh, uh, investor moves, of course, depending on what, what the, the, the earnings have been and uh, the future expectations in the market. And for me, that's it uh, for now. Over to you, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for, for your presentation. And Churchill, thank you very much, too. Uh, Kevin Kamau is, uh, oh, we have questions in the Q&A. And if you have any additional question, you can actually uh, direct them in our Q&A section. Uh, Kamau is asking, uh, despite profit warning, there's an interest in cooperative bank counter. Churchill. Maybe you can cover this. And then okay. maybe Matthew. And then Matthew maybe can uh, cover uh, explaining to Kamau how to invest in Chinese stocks. Uh, thanks, uh, Kamau, for the question. Uh, let me tackle the cooperative one. Uh, what we've seen, and this is something across the whole portfolio of uh, the stocks that are in the market, you've seen that there's been a number of uh, rec there's been a record number of uh, profit warnings and that is a no-brainer last year was quite uh, not the best of years that you've seen on account of COVID-19 and that of course has led to companies issuing profit warnings which ideally is uh, that they are saying that their profits will be lower by more than 25 percent against the previous year's numbers and that obviously comes from uh, uh, the shock that we saw last year. And we still expect that some companies that have not yet announced profit warnings, they'll announce the profit warnings closer to their earnings uh, date. Uh, but that said, just look at the fundamentals for cooperative, we are seeing that it, is, it has one of the best uh, return on equity. So that's another metric of what investors look at, what's the return that they, that they are getting. Uh, we are seeing that cooperative is at 17% against uh, the banking universe is at 10%. The other metric that we are seeing, it's uh, on a relative basis, we are saying that it's price to earnings metric that we are seeing, whether it's overvalued or undervalued. We are saying that it's lower than uh, the market average is at around 5.5%. The market is around 6.9%. So these are some of the things that are attracting investors to go to the cooperative stock, despite the profit warning that somehow they have just uh, Investors are ignoring, just looking beyond uh, those numbers to see, just to look at the attractiveness of the stock. So to answer you, a profit warning is something across the board, uh, but uh, on some of the metrics that you're seeing, be it return on equity, it's quite attractive against the whole banking sector and price to earnings metric, it's showing that it's undervalued against the other banking peers. So Matthew can tackle the question about uh, Chinese stocks. Okay. okay, Churchill. So about the Chinese stocks, yes, of course, you can take advantage of the moves there in the market. And when you go to our platform, when you go to FX as a platform, of course, you can find the China 50 role. If you want to take advantage of, of the stocks in the Chinese side, uh, we have uh, like a composite index that you can use to, um, to speculate on the whole of the market. So look out for the indices, right? we have the China 50 roll. And when you're trading out on the, on the indices, just make sure it's roll because it's the one that you will be able to open and close the trades on, on um, any time that you wish because when you go to the CFDs and uh, there's an expiry time which is set there, then you have to wait for the settlement day. So if you're trading on the indices, just Make sure you select the role. So yes, you can take advantage of the Chinese market, and not only Chinese, but even 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 the stocks on the U.S. side, Asian side, European side. Check out for indices there. And uh, for example, talk of the the the, the, Euro, the, the U.S. Uh, blue chip uh, session that is the Nasdaq. You can take advantage of that, right? S&P 500. So 
It's very possible. And the way you treat these indices is just um, the same way you treat on currencies because the charts are represented the same way. Uh, the, the, the chart patterns there, the ways of trading, the only difference is a little bit on the fundamentals because when you're trading with the stocks, you need to be aware of, of the earnings and um, the movement in, in terms of inflation. So that's it. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Uh, just for the benefit of our clients, CFDs is contracts for derivatives. It's one of those uh, instruments that uh, clients can be able to take opportunity, advantage of when they are with FX PESA. So let me just briefly uh, halt the Q&A and introduce my colleague who sits in the equities desk, that's Kevin Gige, just to give us uh, some deep down uh, analysis of what happened last week in regards to the equities market. So Kevin, over to you. Uh, hello, I don't know if you can hear me. How are you everyone? Yeah. Ah, good. So my name is Kevin Gige. I'm from uh, Genghis Equities Trading Team. So I'm versatile with both equities and bonds. A bit of currencies like Matthew, I think, commodities and, uh, and crypto. So last week was an interesting week, more so not because of all the stocks that we saw, but mostly because of Safaricom. I think we saw a dividend, a recent dividend announcement where they'll be issuing 45 cents as an interim. And I was just discussing with Churchill a few minutes ago that I think this is going to be one of the best dividend plays this year, considering most banks and most uh, manufacturing companies will not be issuing an interim or final dividend since they have to preserve capital. So we saw Safaricom go to highs of 38. Uh, I think those are the all new all-time highs. This is a 61% gain over the last two years. And I think it's uh, almost 610% since inception in, since the IPO in 2008. So Safaricom is one of the names to watch. Uh, luckily, it's also a very, it's very big with the foreigners. So I think we're going to see some, uh, quite some action on that. The banks were fairly quiet. Uh, with the exception of a few, so nothing much to 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 uh, to look up to when you are talking banks, but I think uh, exceptions like Absa, which has also been a very good dividend play, except the last year, uh, has really been steady. Co-op, we've seen it steady at levels of top ninety, hasn't really been punished. It's mostly a local stock, I think, with over eighty five percent of float local. Uh, equity and KCB, of course, are our best uh, players, and I think we have them as buy from our playbook. Other than that, I think uh, the stock to watch next and uh, and uh, where all eyes should be, should be on Safaricom. We anticipated to hit 40s if the uh, last week's rally is anything to go by. Over to you, Churchill. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, so back to you, Dan, for the next set of questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin and Churchill. And actually, uh, there seems to be more interest towards Safaricom. And uh, there's a question here from Lawrence Kanyele, who is asking, can you advise me on Safaricom share on whether they are viable for a long term time, long time and proper e dividend income? Kevin, I think you'd be the best to speak about this. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I have a bias towards Safaricom or it's generally the best talk, but uh, personally, on a personal opinion and capacity is Safaricom is the best talk that we have in the country. If you look last year, headlines saw that Safaricom accounts for 62% of NSC's uh, 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 exchange uh, or trades. So it's one of the biggest stock. We know it's bigger than the next three combined. Uh, it's a long-term stock. We've seen its growth since 2008 at the IPO. We saw it go down to 3.5 and now having picked up all the way to uh, uh, 38. As I mentioned, it's around 610% uh, gain over that period. So. Yes, Safaricom is indeed a long-term uh, stock. There's so many things to look up to. We have the new guy who came in, a few changes. We saw what CBK did with uh, lifting the ban, uh, the, the moratorium on free transactions. So that has really played well. We saw their half year numbers and they were really good. Uh, we know they're looking forward to other places like Ethiopia where they're, they're looking to acquire a license. So to me, Safaricom indeed is a long-term stock. And uh, any levels around these levels would still be a buy. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lois Odor is is asking: uh, Is it too late to buy Can General if one if one wants to take 
uh, to take advantage of the dividends coming on February 22nd? It's it's uh it's not too late to buy. The only challenge that one might have with Kenya General it's very very illiquid. Uh, so uh, expecting to catch it at the market or buy it at the market when there's a dividend announcement coming up or whatever uh, might be happening would be really really tough. But it's not too late. You can still get in. The book's uh, closure date is not yet. Okay, Eric Kombok is asking, uh, the yield on the 364-day Treasury bill has been rising at each auction since September. What is the main reason for the increase and the trend expected? Is the trend expected to continue? Churchill? Uh, thanks, Eric, uh, for the question about uh, the 364-day T bill. Looking at uh, last year, let me start from last year, uh, like bringing things into perspective. So we saw that uh, because of the COVID-19, was this trooping by investors, banks, majorly into the fixed income side. And we saw between, uh, in July, we saw that because of the elevated liquidity in the market, uh, yields in the, in, in yields in the, in the, in the discounted securities. That's the 91-day T-bill, 182-day T-bill, and the 64-day T-bill uh, hitting rock bottom. Obviously, that trend started uh, from April way up until uh, July. And then it started gradually going up slowly from July. But ideally, we are seeing that uh, the biggest impact just aggregating on a quarterly basis. Second quarter, third quarter, we saw that yields on average went down. And that is something that was across the yield curve. So come October, now getting into the fourth quarter, we are seeing that uh, by that time, there was some optimism across the globe that uh, vaccines will be rolled out or there will be discovery of vaccines. So we saw that uh, based on that, there's that marked optimism. And even locally, those talks about a post-COVID economic recovery strategy. So that brings two things to four and, and speaks with the what factors drive our yields, either go up or go down. Uh, one of them is now the expectations for growth. The other one is now inflation expectations being priced in. So let me speak to the first one, expectation for growth. And that is what formally is called reflation trades, whereby because of optimism in the market, in the global arena, and also domestically that COVID-19 will be somehow contained, there's that expectation that growth will start going up. And that also fits in with uh, into the yields, uh, whereby now people start trooping out of the fixed income segment as they go to the riskier asset classes that equities. And the bottom line of that is that now bonds tend to yields tend to rise up if there's that expectations for growth in the economy. So that's one, and that's the reflection trade. The other one is even investor starts uh, pricing in uh, inflation expectations when they bid uh, for, 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 for those securities. And to be sure, so that between April up until September, inflation was on a decline, which formally or technically is called a deflationary trend, uh, disinflation, sorry, disinflation. But from September up until right now, we've seen that there's been a gradual uptick even in inflation. So it could be even investors preempting that inflation will be correctly preempting that inflation will be on an uptrend and it feeds on into the T-bills pricing. So two things. So uh, one is either growth expectation, uh, commonly known as reflection trades, or now investors pricing in increased inflation in the near term. So right now where we are, we are sitting and trying to break it down. What is the drive? What is the primary driver of yields going up? Uh, and to be sure, of course, inflation trends, we are still expected to continue gradual uptick in the near term, the next two months, next three months or so, just on account of the VAT that was reversed back to pre-COVID-19 rates. 
So that's one aspect. The other one is also the bounce back that globally people are seeing. And it's now it's feeding in into the 364 day table to be specific. So primarily, in my view, I think that one of the drivers of uh, one of the drivers of the increase in 364 day T bill yields is now the expectation for growth. And you see even, uh, it's only that the last couple of auctions, you've seen that there's been robust demand in the 364 day T bill. But nonetheless, the yields has been on an uptick. So just telling us that this, that's real rates from an investor perspective are expected to go up just based on the optimism in growth. Sorry, I'm a bit, uh, if, sorry if I came out too technical, not only to Eric, but some of the participants, but bottom line is that uh, the expectations for growth is driving the, the yields, not only in, even, not only in the for the table, but across the spectrum of the discounted securities. So back to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Churchill. Uh, Ian Wangai is asking, is short selling allowed in Kenya? Kevin? Hello. Yeah, so short selling has not yet been effected or implemented. We have a few systems that are coming to play that have already been approved by the exchange that might, and I say might because I'm not speaking on behalf of the exchange, that might allow for short selling. And that means we'll need... Uh, other market players to come in when you start talking about market makers, movers, and uh, liquidity providers. But as we stand, no, short selling is not allowed. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, to Matthew, uh, will you say the best times to trade are during the start of a trading session? For example, the London uh, session. Well, that one depends, because uh, at the times when you find yourself uh, wanting to get into the market quite early, unless you are waiting for really landmark announcements, that's when people start pricing in early enough. And of course, that's when it comes through pending orders because you don't want to be late for the move. But again, uh, the reason why I'm saying it depends is because at the begin at the opening of a session, you first of all want to assess um, the how, how is it going to start out? How are people going to, to, to react maybe to the market movements? And as a, a, a conservative trader, you want to first of all look out at the, the direction that the market is taking before you get yourself in. So again, it depends with whether you're waiting for landmark announcements, that's what will maybe prompt you to try to price in, of course, with pending orders. But if that's not the case, then of course you would want to wait and see the market directions. But again, it depends with your trading strategy. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Dennis Chomba is asking, what is driving the high rise of Safaricom shares? Uh, I think part of that is due to their performance, as we mentioned before. So they had an extremely good half year performance. Secondly, they are issuing, I think it's among the first, after Stan Chat cut its uh, dividend to half, I think it's uh, the first stock or company that has issued an interim dividend so far. And we expect it to be one of the best dividend plays this year considering uh, from expectations is most of the companies, especially banks will not be declaring uh, a dividend. So yeah, it's the best stock, it's the most liquid stock. It has a nice uh, foreign local mix. In, um, it's, it's, I think all these factors are just making it rise and rise. So we've seen it go to highs of 38 and that attribute that mostly and latestly to the dividend. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Naomi Mudanga is actually asking more about the NSC. Uh, is there an existing measure of stock liquidity at the NSC of listed stocks? And uh, the second question, also, uh, are all blue chip companies liquid counters? Uh, it's, it's, that's a fair question. Uh, it depends what we consider blue chip companies. Uh, or what you consider blue chip companies, because that could be different from what I consider blue chip companies. But what, uh, from my understanding, a blue chip company is a company that has a high free float. So that means most of its shares are readily available to trade in the market. For instance, you have Safaricom, which has, I think, uh, over 40 billion uh, in stock. You have equity, which has around, I think, 3.8 billion or 5.2 billion. You have KCB, you have Co-op, though most of it is local. So not all blue chips or so companies consider blue chips are liquid. For instance, Cooperative Bank, one of its major reasons as to why it doesn't 
uh, correlate or the price doesn't correlate with the other banks, especially KCB and equity is, it's really held by their circle. You know, uh, most foreigners don't own co-op and even the locals that own co-op are institutionalized, like their circle, uh, all the other schemes owning it. So you might not say it's liquid, but it's a blue chip. So yeah, not all blue chips are really liquid. You can think, look, uh, look at companies like BAT, it doesn't really trade. Uh, it's not your day-to-day -day trading counter, but it's a blue chip. So to answer that question, not all blue chips are, are liquid stocks. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, investing in gold, uh, can I think this can be done through uh, our partners, uh, FX Pesa, that is Wanja Kanyue had, had asked about this. And no, it cannot be done via our Jengis uh, app, but it can be done via our partners, that is uh, FX Pesa. Uh, Elijah Masaka is also asking about the New York Stock Exchange, participating in it. And all this can be done via FX Pesa. And I think maybe Matthew can speak about that, investing in uh, other stocks, uh, other stock markets, that is the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Uh, Matthew? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, really exciting to see that, uh, of course, the market is excited about the stocks out and there. And again, just to insist on, we don't have to only keep to the currencies or currency pairs. We can also take advantage of the, the stocks outside there. Yes, with FX Pesa platform, when you go to that platform, there is we have several classes of uh, instruments that you can trade. Apart from the currency pairs, we have commodities, and that's where you you're getting into gold. You can getting you can trade with silver, of course. And if you're interested in agricultural sector, again, there is cotton there. So we have all those. There's even platinum. Those are commodities. When you go to stocks, we have uh, you can trade stocks as indices or trade independent stocks. Right, that is, for example, if you want to trade on um, uh, Facebook shares or Google shares, those those uh, technology big technology companies, you can trade them individually. Or if you want to trade on them uh, as um, a, a, a basket of at least uh, a collection of top performing stocks, you can find them as indices. So that is indices as well, and stocks separately, and then the currency pairs, and as well as. Uh, Commodities. So yes, you can take advantage of all markets across. Remember, with FX Pesa here, we are giving you opportunities in the global market. So yes, you can trade on them. And how are you going to do it? It's, it's just the same way you trade on a currency. Make sure you're able to uh, just follow the charts and um, uh, use the same, same techniques. But for stocks, you need to be really much aware of the fundamentals because they really move the markets. You want to know when they're announcing the earnings and uh, when, for example, they are doing mergers and acquisitions, you need to have those uh, tips, uh, uh, those tips um, at the top of your hand. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, one quick question also from Ian Wangai. Uh, when one invests in offshore uh, stocks, how does one earn the dividends? Okay, Is so it? when, sorry. Uh, so when, when you're trading with the offshore stocks, remember you, you are trading on it as a derivative. Actually, you, when, when you're buying uh, a stock or selling a stock, um, you're trading on it as a derivative, meaning that you won't be actually owning a part of it. You're only speculating on the value, the value of the underlying asset. And that's where you have an opportunity of selling, right? You have an opportunity of, of buying on the traps and again selling on, on, on the on the swing highs. So you don't actually own anything, it's just a matter of speculating on the actual movement of the underlying asset. So what you'll be earning is basically on the price movement. For example, if you're expecting that um, the, the, the Jumia, Jumia stock, uh, stock prices will be going higher and higher, then you will be speculating to go long and if actually they, they, they follow the same trend as you had speculated, then you will be in profits. If it doesn't go that way, then you will be in losses. So it's not all about uh, dividends, all right? It's, we're talking more of uh, getting profit when uh, you speculate on the movement of the prices, but those prices are based on the, uh, the changes 
in the market, actual changes in the market of the underlying asset. Okay. Uh, John Kamau is asking, why uh, are we not talking about Kenjen? Is it a good buy at the current 4.8? And we saw a deal about Djibouti last week. What are your views on Kenjen? Kevin? Uh, Kenjen, when it comes to energy stocks, is uh, one of my best. I think it's my best stock. I prefer Kenjen to KPLC for sure. And yes, we saw the deal with the CEO about Djibouti. And one of the things I think Churchill will conquer is they are usually paid back for all these um, uh, drilling initiatives. And one of the other things and advantages that I think Kenjen has over Kenya Power is the ability to, to charge up on Kenya Power for, for all these charges and the government, I think, through tax or I think as Churchill will explain, manages to pay back Kenjen for all its uh, geothermal initiatives. So, yes, Kenjen is a good buy. It's a... It's, uh, it has been a good buy for a while, considering uh, Kenya Power has never declared a profit, while Kenjen has consistently been in profits. That's all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Kevin, for those uh, remarks. I totally concur with you. And just to add on that for the sake of, I think it's Ian, or I don't know who's asked the question, uh, is that it's part also of our value stocks. Uh, Kenjen and uh, Ken, yeah, Kenjen. It's also part of the value stocks, whereby we have a target price of uh, 7, uh, 7 shillings and uh, 11 cents, thereabouts. So at 4.8 uh, shillings, uh, current 4.8 shillings currently, there's still some upside. Uh, it's above what uh, Kevin has said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Clement Karanja is asking, what is the state of Jumia shares in the market as per today? Uh, Matthew? Yeah, yeah, uh, spot on on that. Uh, for the Jumia shares, currently it's uh, pulling back from the highs of um, the highs of 69, just 69? Yeah, 69, 70 is there. It's uh, settling around 62.43. And uh, that's where we are currently. It's like since, since um, the, 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 it's at the beginning of January, yeah. No, on 25th of January, it has been uh, playing around, um, just playing around the, the levels of 58, 59, all the way to 72. But again, with Jumia shares, it's one that has really pulled a big move since, um, since 2020, right? Sorry about that. It has pulled a very big move, has gone all the way from the levels of 19 or 20 all the way to 60. So it has gone like 60, is it, is it um, a very big percentage actually? Is it, is it like 400%? Uh, Not quite sure, but this move pulled a very big move. Right now, stalling around, around those levels. So uh, we might be waiting to see whether uh, it is going maybe to get support along the previous um, previous level in January, where it had uh, pulled low all the way to 54, and then before jumping up again. So, but again, with the Jumia, remember it's it's one of the distribution channels that we had, and it's really rose during the time of um, of coronavirus, and right now it's easing up. So we don't know whether, um, uh, as the people are like are getting back to. The, the local markets and local distribution channels where it's going to stall a little bit. But of course, remember, it's only the technology sector and again, markets are opening up. So we want to wait and see whether it's going to rebound back and move beyond the 70s level. Otherwise, it's one stock that has really taken a very big move and something to, to watch over the long term. Daniel? Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, Kevin, uh, there is one last question here for you. I think a follow-up to a, a question asked earlier by Naomi Mudanga. She's asking, uh, is there an existing measure of liquidity at the NSE? Like, for example, can an investor easily know which counters are liquid or illiquid? Well, if they refer to the NSC in terms of the exchange, like could you go onto their website and uh, easily check which fact, uh, which counters are liquid or illiquid, then no, you don't have such a measure when it comes to the exchange. 
you might have such a measure uh, when you check on our research, you might show you which are the uh, most liquid stocks, which are not. Uh, and it all depends, I think, with the market cap. So you'll find that the bigger uh, market cap or the higher market cap stocks will tend to be the most liquid. Uh, we are talking about KCB, we are talking about Safaricom, we are talking about uh, EABL at some time, Equity Bank and the rest. So if you check our research, we may give you that insights, but from the NSC platform, no, you might not check that. So if you want to check on liquidity, you can talk to us and we can uh, show you that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Churchill, uh, I think maybe you can touch on the issue of uh, on ownership of shares and as a source of, uh, or rather, is it a source of an additional source of income? Ah, uh, well, ownership of shares by itself, uh, unless now you, the point whereby it's an additional source of income is if you get the dividend payments or the capital appreciation of, at the end of it when you exit. So you can only realize upon exit, uh, that's with the capital appreciation or the dividend incomes that pays in between. But having said that, just looking at the whole uh, contour of the current equity investment, uh, current equity space, we are seeing that we are not quite bullish what Kevin has been talking about. We are not quite bullish that the, most companies will issue dividends. In fact, we, it just narrowed to three or five names over the course of this year. Uh, so, uh, so in terms of the dividend, we are not that bullish. Capital appreciation is still... Um, with sewing. So we are looking at uh, now with Safaricom, it's really rallied even in the current year. Uh, so that is whereby an investor who had, who had say, hypothetical example, who had entered Safaricom at the beginning of this year, up until right now, has made some, can be able to exit at some decent gains. So I can say ownership of shares in that context is a source of income. Uh, and uh, a, a question, a follow-up question is how to maybe file for annual returns in during annual returns. Uh, well, uh, right now we don't have the capital gains tax, at least in regards to equity investments. Uh, Kevin might correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but we have the what it had been proposed, I think, five years ago, four years ago, the capital gains tax, but it's not applicable to uh, equity investment. Uh, that's uh, equity investment. But that said, I think for dividends, this that element of uh, withholding tax, unless I'm mistaken again, uh, I know for bonds, there's usually some withholding tax, uh, but for dividend payments, I, I'm not quite sure whether there's uh, that element of uh, dividend return, uh, withholding tax payments. So for in regards to filing returns, it, it has a neutral effect. Yeah, I think it's right in terms of, uh, or when it comes to dividends, there's a withholding tax, I think it's 15%. Uh, when it comes to equity shares and when you're exiting CGT, or as you know it, uh, the capital gains tax was suspended uh, prior to review. So we don't know when that will happen. But as we stand, uh, as for filing for tax return for the prior year, uh, your equity holdings or your securities holdings uh, do not affect. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think one last question to Kevin is, what is the future of the Nairobi Stock Exchange? <laughs> Even now, there's, <laughs> uh, there's Kevin, that. Kevin has the crystal ball to it, so Kevin. <laughs> it's, it's a wide uh, topic. Uh, NSE just released their framework. I think they're five or six year framework in terms of where they want to see the exchange. We know there are a couple of exciting things that are about to come to our market. We have DMA, the direct market access. Uh, we have new players like a guy called Remora who are coming to change the technology that we use uh, that was from MIT. Uh, we have all these fancy uh, investment uh, uh, opportunities that are coming. We might have short selling. Uh, we already introduced derivatives. So, I mean, right now it's all systems go. We don't know how quick the NSC will be to effecting these changes, but... Um, I mean, even when it comes to the bonds market, uh, we are about to see a couple of changes. Uh, bonds primarily trade as OTC. Uh, that might change in the near future, and we might start seeing bonds trade more like shares in terms of we have the bid spread asks and uh, and all that, the depth monitor and everything uh, uh, to it. So 
the future is bright. I'm an optimist. Um, uh, how the NSC and CMA, how quick they implement that is, uh, is unknown. But yeah, I mean, very good things are coming. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for joining us today. And Matthew and Churchill, thank you very much. And we, you can action this what the, the, from the, the decisions you will make from this discussion. You can action it in our, in our application, Jikuze, that is by buying or selling shares in the of companies listed in the Nairobi Stock Exchange. And you can also uh, work through our partner, that is FX Pesa, buy and sell uh, shares and commodities uh, via their app, that is uh, uh, FX Pesa. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much for attending.